Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode of 10 Questions, we have gender and culture in the Middle Ages. So we're going to start with education. Education in the Middle Ages was practical. It's counting, it's farming, it's herding. Few people read. Knowledge was generally accepted information. It's superstition. It's tradition. Why? Why is it so limited? What happened to philosophy? What happened to astronomy? What happened to all the theoretical stuff? The answer is is that, excuse me, the answer is that everything had broken down. Large institutions had broken down after the Roman Empire. So schooling, so philosophy, so scientific research had all broken down. Archives, great libraries, they're all gone. All of that knowledge was destroyed. So that life became rural, agricultural, religious, and local for people. People didn't leave. They were born grew up, lived, married, had children, and died within 20 miles of the same place. It's kind of like Samwise in Lord of the Rings, where he hits a part in a farm, and he's like, this is the farthest I've ever gone. Well, that's most people. They simply didn't move. They simply didn't leave. Why? Well, because the world was small. It was scary. See Snow White in the woods. See Rapunzel. See Cinderella. These are not women who leave. People didn't leave. Notice for Rapunzel to leave her home, to leave the valley that she's grown up with, to to leave her tower, She needs to hang out with a bandit. So the world was small. The world was scary. Superstition mattered. And knowledge was what was generally accepted by people. There wasn't research. There wasn't investigation. There's not experimentation. There's a scene in Game of Thrones where um, Daenerys asks a question and her maids give her an answer. And she's like, are you sure? That doesn't sound very right. And they go, it is known. And the other one goes, it is known. It is, this is just the way it is. <clears throat> it's what my parents would have called common sense. It's just common sense. It's common sense that the universe revolves around the earth. Go outside, look at the stars at night. They move, they turn. It is known. So what about women in the pre-Renaissance? Well, they're not as strong as men, biologically. So they were considered inferior to men. Economically, women could not farm as well as men. And in a world where 98% of people are farmers, women were seen as inferior. The consequence of that was that women were then inferior in all ways, morally, spiritually, and thus in need of protection. And so this is one reason why marriage happened in the teens and to a known boy of about the same age. It's to keep them out of trouble. But it's also because wealth was tied to land and the income from land was predictable. You knew how much money that land would produce year after year after year. Farmers do this today. You ask a farmer, how much is your land worth? How much does it make? The first question they're going to ask you is, well, what do I plant? Because if I plant corn, I've got 3,000 acres of corn, or do I plant wheat? Or I plant barley, or do I plant soy, soybeans? 
Like those are all different prices, but they could tell you, they know. And that's the value of land. It's predictable and you know who's going to inherit it. You know it's going to be the eldest son who's going to inherit it. And so you can get married at 15, 16, 17 because you know what the boy is going to be worth. You know what the land is going to be worth. You, you can predict out the future. That's very different from the Renaissance. That's very different from today. I have no idea what I'm going to be worth five years from now. I've got a good idea. The bank has a good idea, which is why they give me a mortgage, why they give me a credit card balance, why uh, I'm able to do various things. I have my income, which is from a fairly secure job. I have got my retirement investments. But if you ask me how much to, you know, to say the thousand dollar I'll be worth in 20 years, I can't tell you. Because my wealth, our wealth, is based on income. It's based on labor. So you don't really know what will happen in the future. Whereas land, the land will have a value and it will produce a commodity of value. And so who did you marry? For the most part, you married a second cousin or the son of your parents' best friend. We see this clearly in the literature. In, in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, in Louisa May Alcott's Little Women, the people who are expected to get married is Lizzie to her cousin, William Collins, and Joe to her neighbor, Lori. Now, neither one of these girls marry that boy. But in Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennett, Lizzie's mom, wants her to get married to William Collins. Lizzie's best friend expects this to happen, right? It's, it's an expectation. He's family. He's a second cousin. He's going to inherit the land after the father, after Mr. Bennett dies, because Mr. Bennett has no daughters. And so Mrs. Bennett is worried that she's going to be kicked out off the house. She's going to be kicked out of her house. And so the best solution is to marry one of her daughters to Mr. Collins. And Mr. Collins is a vicar, so he's got a secure job. He's not sexy like Mr. Darcy is, but he's safe and he's secure. And so the idea for Mrs. Bennett is to marry one of her daughters to Mr. Collins, which would make them connected, which would make sure that she, as a widow, doesn't get kicked off the land. That the daughters are safe. Because Mr. Collins, a cousin and husband of Lizzie, would never do that. Would never make these women insecure. They're family. And so when Lizzie decides not to marry Mr. Collins, and she's willing to do it for ex that exact reason. She goes to her father and she's like, I'll do it, but I don't really want to. The father says, good, I don't want you to. I would be mad at you if you did. It's your decision. Notice we keep seeing this, right? We keep seeing that the families are involved in women's marriage choices, but don't have the final say, that there is a veto power for the women. And Lizzie has that veto power. She has the right to say yes. She has the right to say no. She says no to Mr. Collins. She says no to Mr. Darcy in one of the most famous scenes in the book. So... The father's like, no, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll figure out the inheritance. I will figure out. It's my job as a husband and a man and a father to figure out, to make sure you're safe, to need protection. I'll take care of it. But Mrs. Bennett is heartbroken, hysterical about it because she doesn't know what it means for her life or her younger daughter's life. Because Mr. Collins, while not sexy, was a safe and known quantity. He was a cousin. 
He was a second cousin. And so he could be relied upon to keep them safe. Joe and Lori is not so, I mean, the family wants Joe to marry Lori. The audience demanded that Joe marry Lori. It's still today. Every time someone reads Little Women for the first time, they, they want Joe to marry Lori. Louise May Alcock got so much fan mail, or hate mail it would be, about them not getting married that she had to write a sequel in which Joe got married to an unsexy professor, <laughs> to kind of William Collins. So Lizzie doesn't marry William Collins, and Joe does. But Lori stays within the family. Lori's going to marry one of Joe's sisters. Why? Because it's a known quantity. He's a son of a friend of the parents. He's a leading person in town. He's known. So thus, women can stay together, the families can stay together, and women gain that protection. So a husband's death equaled a problem. Who gets the land? Is there an old enough son? If there is an old enough son, everything stays the way it is, and that old enough son can take over the land and run the farm. But what if there's not an old enough son? What happens to the widow? Does she get remarried? Does she re get reduced to poverty? See these scary old women in Disney movies. They're all old, poor, and unconnected. No children, no husband. That's Hand the Witch in Hansel and Gretel. That's witches in the witch trials are old women who are widowed. They don't have children. They don't have husbands to protect them. They are seen as estranged from the community. They are seen as weird. They are seen as scary. So what about remarriage? Well, they could remarry one of two groups of people, either a stranger, and what that does is take the land, if not out of the family, it will take her out of the family and with her, the children out of the family. So if the land goes to a, a brother of the husband, right, and stays in the original family, the, the widow and the children, you lose. They'll go with the new husband. They'll go with the stepfather. They're gone. And so one of the earliest solutions to this was that you remarry within the family. You marry one of the brothers of your husband. And we, you may go, well, that's kind of gross. You're going to marry your brother-in-law? The idea of that is that it keeps the family together. We actually see this in the Bidens. Hunter Biden had a relationship with his brother's wife, with his brother's widow, with Bo Biden's widow. Now, part of that is trauma. Part of that is sadness. Part of that is coming out of this painful loss for both of them, and they had something in common. But it also keeps her and her children, the nieces and nephews, it keeps them all in the Biden family. It keeps them together. I've had this in my own family. My grandmother died when my father was a teenager. And my grandfather ended up in a long-term relationship with one of her sisters. Why? Well, because it kept him and his income and his protection and his connections and my father in the family. It kept them all close so that when I was a teenager, my grandfather, as he was dying of cancer, was still taken care of. He had broken up with the sister he was dating uh, back somewhere in the 70s or early 80s. He had still was still taken care of some of the widowed sisters, some of his widowed sisters-in-law. So that when he died of cancer, my father and us, the children, took over that job of caring for the widowed aunts.
that may not have happened if my grandfather had left the family, married another woman, and disappeared and gone off. So the idea was you keep the land together, you keep the income together, you keep the families together. This is in the Bible. The Bible has two places, at least two places, that specifically tell brothers to marry their brother's widow, to marry their sister-in-law. It's in Deuteronomy, and it's in Mark 12. Both of them are expressions that if your brother dies, you are supposed to protect your sister-in-law. She's family. So you marry her. You keep your brother's children in the family. That's your obligation. That's Deuteronomy. That is Mark, where the, they go to ask, where the Pharisees, or the Pharisees, I think, ask Jesus. And it's a gotcha question, right? If you're so smart, if you're so smart, Jesus, seven brothers marry the widow, marry their sister-in-law, right? Because each one marries because they, they keep dying. Each brother dies. Who's married to her in heaven? And that's Jesus going, ha, 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 ha. Nobody. Because there is no marriage in heaven. There's no ownership in heaven. Everything is perfect in heaven. He doesn't quite go that far, but it's an indication that you're beyond humans. You're beyond the body. You're beyond your spirit. You don't need to marry. You don't need those human relationships in heaven. That that world ends. But the idea that one of the younger brothers should marry the widow of their brother is well established and not considered weird. It's considered an obligation because it keeps everybody together. Okay. What about women's relationships in the Middle Ages? Well, women's relationships in the Middle Ages are a small circle of other related women. Tight associations with sister cousins in small towns. You are connected. Your cousins are connected. They're very important. Your second cousins are connected. Few women owned businesses or moved far from home. So they lived in a world that was separate but interactive with men. That they lived in these associations of other women. Their best relationships were with women, not with their husbands, not with men. Notice in Little Women, all the daughters get married, but they stay essentially close together and they stay together as a unit and raise their children essentially together. The same is going to be assumed in Pride and Prejudice. There is no assumption that even though Jane and Lizzie married different men, in fact, they marry best friends for a reason. Part of the attraction of Mr. Darcy is that he's the best friend of Mr. Bingsley. So that they're as sisters, they both align those two families in blood as opposed to just friendship, and they bring it all together, which is why... Mr. Bingsley's sisters are so mad all the time at Lizzie. They see him, her, as crowding in on their territory. One of them is supposed to marry Mr. Darcy. Because they're the sister of Mr. Bingsley. You want to ally the families, that's how you do it. And Mr. Darcy's resisting that, but the sister's like, we can wait. It's going to happen. He's got to marry somebody. He can't be he can't be a bachelor. Right? It's it becomes weird if you get into your 30s and you're a bachelor in this world. You have to have children. You you have to get married. You have to have children. So they're willing to wait it out. Because it's the most because as sooner or later he's gonna go, all right, I'll marry one of your sisters. You know, of course I'm gonna marry one of your sisters. You know? Because it keeps these families and friendships together. But these women also lived in a separate world from men, though they interacted with men on a daily basis. So it's not, it's not the Islamic world where the two worlds are completely apart. They're like a Venn diagram where there are places that are just women, places that are just men, but there is also a place where men and women share. 
What about Jewish women? Well, Jewish women in Western Europe. Now, in Eastern Europe, they're much more poor. They are much more uh, farming communities in Lithuania, in Ukraine, in Poland. In these places, they look like their Christian neighbors, Jewish women. But in Western Europe, they're much more urban. They're still subservient to men. Men are still going to run the society. Women like can't be rabbis, for example. But women can be learned. They can be educated. They're better educated than Christian women. And the reason why is because in Judaism, like Islam, there is an expectation to be able to read and understand the Torah. Now, does that mean you become a Torah scholar? No. You're not supposed to have the high-level master's degree professionalism of a scholar of the Torah. But are you supposed to know what the laws are and the rules are and able to be able to raise your children to be good Jewish boys and girls? Yes. This is why the bar and the bat mitzvahs, the action where a boy becomes a man and a girl becomes a man, isn't a ceremony of a priest giving you a blessing on top of, giving you something separate. It is a ceremony where you read. The action that makes you makes you the adult is reading, which for us is boring because you could read by the time you're, of course you could read by the time you're 13. You're supposed to read by the time you're five or six or seven. You know, you should be able to read. That's not a problem. By 13, come on, 90% of people in America are literate in some way, shape, or form by 13, right? So this is, this is assumed, but not in the Middle Ages, not in the ancient world. <clears throat> and for Jewish people, there's the added complication that you're not in Jerusalem, you're not in Judea, you're not living with many other Jews, which means to be literate in the Torah is to be literate in a completely different language you don't use. So it's to be literate in the Torah is to keep the culture alive in a world that doesn't want you to keep that culture alive, that wants you to assimilate, that wants you to become French or German or Polish because the definition of French and German and Polish is Christian and other things. It's not being Jewish. And so if there's toleration, and there isn't always toleration, and we'll get to that later in 102, it is very important for Jewish communities to remain their Jewishness. So women had to be educated. And since Jewish people in Western Europe are more urban, and that goes back to when the Romans picked people up and moved them, they destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed Judea, they picked up the Jews, and they scattered them like the Assyrians did to the ten lost tribes. The Romans did the same thing in order to assimilate them, to scatter them like dust to the wind in order for them to disappear. In a hundred years, they would be marrying into Roman families, speaking Latin, and they'd be gone. That was the intention. So you might only have two, three, four Jewish families in a town. And so to have to keep that community together, they became more urban. So since they're more urban, they run businesses. Women had to be able to run businesses while the men are away or after widowhood. Their lives are more tied to money than Christian women. Christian women are more tied to land. And so since it's very important for Jewish communities to maintain their, maintain their Jewishness, you needed long-distance relationships in marriage because you quickly intermarried between the only Jewish families in town. So you needed to connect to other Jewish families in other towns. And so with that long-distance relationship through marriage came long-distance relationship in business, became trade. Hey, I manufacture farming equipment, so every time uh, I go 
to go see my in-laws. I take my wife to go see her parents and her, her sisters. I'm going to load up my cart with stuff I manufacture, and I'm going to go see my father-in-law. And while my wife is hanging out with her sisters, I'm going to see my father-in-law and my brothers-in-law, and we're going to make a deal. I'm going to sell them my farming stuff. They're going to buy my farming stuff, and then they're going to sell my farming stuff to the local community. And we all make money, and everybody's better off. And so marriage and business go together, but it's long distance, and that's the important part. Whereas we talked about most culture is very small, is very local. Jewish communities, by necessity, had to reach out, had to spread, had to make connections over long distances. Because you were very quickly too interrelated with the people around you. And so the small groups created tight local networks with other Jewish women within the community. The other Jewish women were the only women who were sharing your same experience. And there weren't that many of them. So this is like Amish women in Pennsylvania. They had to be tight. They were interrelated, either by marriage or by blood. And it didn't matter, even if they weren't. They were tied together because they were a vast minority in a place that didn't want them. So they had to work together. They had to help each other. And so you have these long-distance relationships that spread out from Paris to Normandy, from Paris to Lyon, you know, 100 miles. But you also had very tight local relationships within that small town in order to survive. Okay, so what are the causes of the Renaissance and why would kings like universities? Well, the Renaissance is the rebirth of Greek and Roman knowledge. And one reason, it's not the only reason, but one reason that you get it is because of the Black Death. The bubonic plague kills 25 to 50 percent of people in Europe. And any kind of plague that does that much damage has to be explained. And the only smart people around are the priests. And so they went to the priests and said, why, why is this happening to us? And the priests had an answer. Look at the Old Testament. Look at Moses. There's plagues. God sends plagues to hurt people who don't listen, right? Look at Jeremiah. <clears throat> and so you're, you're bad, and this is your punishment. And people said, okay, what do we have to do to go be good? And they say, act this way. And the problem was the plague didn't go away. Also, the plague also killed people who were clearly innocent. Babies, three-year-olds. It also killed grandmamas. It killed people who everyone assumed was going to heaven, who were good people. And people went, wait, why? Why are people dying who shouldn't be dying of a plague if the plague was meant to punish people? And the church went, uh, uh, we don't know. We can't explain this. In fact, half of priests are going to die because priests were the caretakers. They gave last rites, right? They gave emotional and physical comfort to the ill. If they were good priests, good at their job, they were around the illness. Just like one of the largest, largest contingents of people to get COVID in the earliest days, remember, were doctors and nurses, were healthcare professionals, and that completely wrecked the system. So many doctors and nurses were getting COVID in the earliest days that <clears throat> that's why in the earliest days there was don't wear masks because there weren't enough masks for the doctors and the nurses and we needed the doctors and nurses to not get sick. So they needed all the protection they could get. It's only when manufacturing kicked back in 
that we had masks for everybody. So that was true in the Black Death. The church couldn't explain this mass trauma that was happening, so people needed another answer. The second thing was that powerful kings were creating larger states, and those larger states needed more smart people to run the government. And those smart people can't be priests. Why can't they be priests? Because priests were technically loyal to the Pope, and if the king got into a fight with the Pope, say, over paying taxes, they needed to rely on their government officials to have their back. They couldn't suspect that their government officials would ally with the Pope against them. So you needed an education that was not tied to religion. You needed an education separate from religion. Either you had to invent a whole new education, or you could just use the smart stuff that already existed. And the smart stuff that already existed was Greek and Roman, the language, the literature of people who were winners. So they used that, right? The Greeks conquered the world under Alexander, the Romans conquer the world. Why wouldn't you use their knowledge? And so what is invented is the university. The university is a place where subject scholars gather in one place and people go to them. Instead of bringing smart people to you, you go to a group of smart people. The opposite of what Philip II does with Alexander. When Philip II wants to educate Alexander, he hires Aristotle and brings Aristotle up from Greece to Macedon, plops him in the, in the palace and says, okay, teach my son. And while you're at it, teach some of his friends too. They're, he, they're going to be allies. They're going to be his generals and his governors. So you might as well teach them as well. They might as well, you know, go to school together. So what the university is creating is this community of learners by bringing together smart people who are experts in one field and then bringing the students to them, it creates a place. Now, we talk about how the first university in Europe is in Bologna, Bologna, Italy, but it's not the first university ever. The first university that works this way is, is probably in Fez, in Tunisia, in Uh, the Middle East. It's in the Islamic world. There's Timbuktu as well, which if not earlier than Bologna is is up here. It's at the same time. And Timbuktu is important. It's a good example because what you get is the rise of the university city. Timbuktu was not a, a super political city. It does become an economic city, mostly because of the education. And then it's tied to trade over the Sahara. Why? Because faculty and students need stuff. And they have money. They have a dependable amount of money every year. The students are wealthy. They're, the students are the sons of noble people. And what they're going to have is money to buy books, to buy food, to buy stuff. Faculty need books. They need pens. They need paper. They need furniture, desks, right? The students have to live at the university. So they need a room, a cell, which is the room priests would live in. It's a studio apartment. It's small, right? It's just the basics. It's a bed, but you also need a closet where you put your clothes. You need a desk that you could write at. You need bookshelf for all your books. You need furniture to be made. So they need stuff. So who's going to show up? Where a university? So you plop down a university in Paris or Bologna or Uppsala in Sweden. And what happens is the merchants come. Also culture. You're going to have plays and art and shows and public lectures, right? You're going to have these faculty members express their expertise. So the art teachers are going to put on shows. The art students are going to put on shows. The actor, the acting students have to put on plays, right? You're going to, okay, we're going to study Aeschylus's The Persians. You can read it, but that doesn't tell you how to really do it. You have to watch it. 
You have to watch Aeschylus's The Persians or the Oresteia. You know, you have to do um, Sophocles. They're plays. They're meant to be done to an audience. And so to understand the play, it's Shakespeare, right? The play's the thing. You could read Shakespeare and still, while it's beautiful, not understand it. You have to watch it. You can read it and get a lot out of it, but you don't get it till you watch it. So the plays and the art and the music, you can't do music alone. You have to do music in public together. So there's always culture. University cities are islands of culture in the sea that is the local, agricultural, illiterate world around them. Take a look. You live in that world with Penn State. Penn State is in the middle of Pennsylvania. It is the middle of nowhere, and yet it's 100,000 people, and it has great sports, great art, great literature. It has uh, the suburbs or some of the richest in the country. It is, it is blue. It is a democratic city in the sea that is a red, red counties all around it. It is surrounded by forest, by farmers. And yet every time you look on a map of politics or economics or education in the sea that is Pennsylvania, you have Philadelphia in the east, you have uh, Pittsburgh in the west, and in the center, in the north, you have one place, and that's Penn State. That's College Park. In the south, you have Harrisburg, where the government is. But everywhere else between that, in that sea, James Carville called Alabama. Other people call Pennsylvania. That it's, it's rural, agricultural, hardworking, Christian folk. It's not urban. It's not trade. It's not finance. It's rural, spread out agriculture. Or, in Pennsylvania, the forest, the Susquehanna Forest. But also, with the rise of the university city and is the coming of teenage boys, somewhere between 16 and 20, 21, 22, you get the coming of teenage boys who have money and time, right? There's a lot of time where you're not doing anything in college, especially if you don't have to work. And part of the point of college was not just the education, it was the connections. You were at college with the other sons of rich people. These were people you were going to go and live the rest of your life with in government, working for the king. You might meet a prince, a king's son, who might become king. And so the networking was important. You needed that time off to hang out, to drink, to talk. And so decadence and sex and games and sport become part of college culture too. Animal House is how lots of people think college is, that it's all fun and no education. It's all drinking and trying to hook up. And that's not it, but that's always been a part of it. And so there's always this breaking of moral laws in college. These young men do naughty things. And who shows up? Young women willing to sell naughty things to those boys for a price. They're rich, they've got money, these women need money, and so they show up as well. And so what you end up with is this concept of the boys will be boys. Boys are going to do what they're going to do. They're teenage boys. What do you expect from them? They're not killing anybody. And any things they do do that are bad can be papered over with money. No one's saying they're innocent. In fact, they're saying the opposite. But what they are saying and what the king will have to do is make moral laws unimportant, at least for young, rich men. That sex with a prostitute is just not that big of a deal. It's okay, right? Getting someone pregnant outside of marriage? Oh, well, you have to take care of that child. 
you give them money. Boom, done, moving on. You know, homosexual sex, it's okay in college. At some point you leave and then you get married and then you go on. But when you're a young man, hey, what happens at Eden stays at Eden. That's Christopher Higgins who talks about everybody at these, at the all male schools, all male sleepaway high schools, the elite high schools. They all hooked up with each other. They all hooked up in the way Spartans hooked up. Older men, older boys, older men, but no, older boys, the 17 year old, 18 year olds, had boyfriends who were 14, 15, 16. And because there were no women around, yeah, that's what happened. But also, if there are women around, you did naughty stuff with them too. So there's, there's the idea that moral laws no longer are important. They, they may be on the books, but the king isn't enforcing them. Even the local priests don't enforce them. Like you have, you say you're sorry, and you, the priest says don't do it again. So there's this idea that morality is not a big thing for young rich men. They'll grow into it. Boys will be boys. So what is taught? Greeks and Romans, the Bible. You still have to teach the Bible, but Greeks and Romans. Marcus Aurelius is going to teach you Stoicism, which is basically masculinity at this point. How to act like a man. How to act like a leader. That's Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor. Plutarch is going to also teach you how to be a man, but by using biography, the lives of famous Greeks and Romans. And they're going to say, act like the guys, act like these guys who did good things and avoid the bad things that they did. Thucydides is going to teach war, diplomacy, and politics. Aristotle is going to teach science and how to engage in the world. So look at all the things that we're teaching. We're teaching leadership. We're teaching uh, masculinity. We're teaching war. We're teaching diplomacy. We're teaching government and politics. We're teaching science and nature. You are getting a wide variety of stuff. There's also going to be um, medicine as well from the Greeks. There's going to be math from the Greeks and the Egyptians. And then later on, there'll be uh, algebra. There'll be um, math from the Middle East. Notice when we write in math, we use Arabic numerals. We don't use Latin. We don't write. And the only place where I see Roman numerals is in the Super Bowl. Everywhere else is Arabic. We're writing in Arabic all the time. All right. That brings us to St. Thomas Aquinas. He writes the Summa Theologica. This classical, the idea that classical science and classical uh, Christian revelation equal God. That all knowledge leads to God. It doesn't matter how it's discovered. Now, you know that that's a conflict because we live in that conflict today. That's the conflict of Darwinism. Where people go, no, 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 no. I am not descended from monkeys. Darwin doesn't say that. He just says we're related to them. I come from God. God made Adam and Eve. Right? How do I know that? The Bible tells me. That's revelation. That's revelation. Revelation is I know it because God revealed it. I know it because I know it. Because it's a rule of nature. So science and Christianity, science and religion in Europe are always in conflict. Always in conflict. What is the true knowledge? What is right? And in the Dark Ages and the early Middle Ages, the idea was, no, the Bible is right. But with the return and the renaissance of Greek ideas, there's a lot there that, saw, that religion can't answer. The bubonic plague is one of them. And here comes Thomas Aquinas, who may be the smartest man since Augustine in Western Europe. He's just up there in the pantheon of, like, smartest men of their age. And he writes the Summa Theologica, where he says all knowledge leads to God. It doesn't matter. Since God created all things, 
right? And everyone goes, yes, of course, God created the universe. Since God created the universe, everything you learn about the universe was made by God. So how you learn about the universe is godly. So it doesn't matter. Both ways lead to God. And so he's making the argument that scientists make today, that Newton makes, science is not at war with religion. And the Summa Theologica uses Aristotle to prove that the monotheistic God, the God of Abraham, Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, that the God of Abraham exists. And he has five ways he does that. He has five proofs, right? Scientific proofs, mathematical proofs. And he, one of the big ones is the unmoved mover, which Newton is going to use in his, in his Principia, the Principia Mathematica. The unmoved mover is the idea, and Aristotle has this, and Aquinas agrees with it, that all things in motion can only be in put in motion by something else in motion. Think of a pool table, right? Think of a game of pool. You rack up your 10 balls in a pyramid, right, at one end of the table. At the other end of the table is a white ball, the cue ball, and it sits there, and it never moves. And as long as it never moves, those 10 balls in the pyramid never move. You could go and have dinner. You could go have a drink. You could go get your daughter married and come back to your pool table and it will still be there. It might have dust on it, but those balls, the cue ball will still be at one end of the table and the 10 other balls will be in a pyramid at the other end of the table. The game of billiards does not start to somebody hits the cue ball into that pyramid of balls. In action, you hit the cue ball. The cue ball is now in motion. It hits the pyramid of, of billiard balls, causing a reaction, and those billiard balls shoot out to all different parts of the table. You now have a new status, which will stay until somebody hits the cue ball into other balls and thus starts the game. The game has started. Once you hit the cue ball, the game has started. You try to take your dollar bill, you try to take your 20 bucks, the, your bet, off the table after the cue ball has been hit, you are going to have a fight. You are in trouble. Bad things happen. But until that moment, until that moment that that cue ball is hit, the game hasn't started. So what Aristotle says and what Thomas Aquinas agrees with and what Newton agrees with is all things are in motion because other things put them in motion. Great. What puts them in motion? Well, something puts something in motion. Well, if you go back enough in time, you need something that puts everything in motion, but nothing put it in motion. The unmoved mover, the thing that starts, that hits the cue ball, but is itself not acted upon by another force. Do you see how this move, this works? For Thomas Aquinas, for Newton, that's God. The unmoved mover is clearly God, a Christian God, right? That's Genesis. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Boom, the action, right? For being, a, for being written down a couple hundred years before Aristotle comes along, but being an older tradition than that, Genesis 1 is very Aristotelian in its, in its description, that it's an unmoved mover moving things to create them. And that one thing gives birth to something else. The separation of the waters 
creates the land. Now, Newton's going to do the same thing, but with more math in his Principia Mathematica. And the best example of this in modern science, though, is the Big Bang. The Big Bang is discovered by a Christian priest. So you get these things like, like, um, you know, they go, uh, should, should, um, schools teach, um, that the, the religious notion, the Pope's notion, the, uh, of, uh, that the earth is the center of the universe and you get, oh, liberals say, no, 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 of course not. Right. That's dumb. And then they go, should, should, um, students learn Father Frank's nation notion of the of the birth of the universe, and liberals go, no, of course not, and then conservatives go, ha ha ha, that's the Big Bang, idiots. And the idea is that you're playing on the assumptions of other people. You're playing on the assumption that the Christian Church must be conservative, and so the Christian Church isn't going to be science. It's not going to endorse science. But it does. Some of the best astrology, astronomy sites in the world are owned by the Catholic Church. That's why Galileo is both has such a big problem with the Catholic Church, but also is Galileo is such a problem for the church because of their role together. But the Big Bang is the explosion of the universe. The universe was condensed into this tiny, 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 tiny ball of mass that weighed somewhere around, I don't know, 10 pounds, was it? They could measure close to what it should have weighed, right? All the universe was in this little microscopic ball that was so tight that a spark happened and it exploded and boom, almost instantly, you get this massive universe. It, 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 it shoots out at the speed of light, at faster than the speed of light. What created that spark? Clearly, a spark had to happen. What created that spark? And the answer is, nobody knows. Nobody can tell you. Science cannot tell you what existed a millionth of a second before that spark. They can tell you what existed a millionth of a second after that spark, but not before it. So if you're religious, if you believe in religious, in Christian re revelation or religious re revelation, that spark is God. And science can't disprove that. So for Thomas Aquinas, science and religion are not at war. Okay. In our next episode, we're going to do marriage and how it changes during the Renaissance. Marriage and love and relationships during the, during the Renaissance. Okay, so take care, be safe, and talk to you soon.